Hello, welcome back. I'm very glad to join with you again to continue my reflections on the living gospel written in the lives of holy people. Notice that I don't necessarily speak of saints, though Dorothy Day may one day be canonized. But too often when we speak of saints, we think of perfect people, close to God, but not like us. The kind of holy people that interest me are people I can recognize as fully human, meaning flawed, fully conscious of their own weaknesses, their own doubts, questions, and uncertainties, and yet who, in the earnestness of their love for God and their determination to go where God is calling them, may do more to inspire us on our own journey than many canonized saints. Case in point, Henry Nouwen. I came to know him well, first as a friend and mentor when I was a young editor at the Catholic Worker back in the 1970s, and later also as one of my Orbis authors. He had many editors in his life, but by a strange turn, I turned out to be the last. And, as is the case with Merton and Dorothy, I continue many years after his death to reflect on his life and what it was all about. In my previous talk about Merton, I quoted some of the texts in which he seemed to envision his death. In a similar spirit, Henry Nouwen once contemplated his own end. Standing in a crowded lecture hall at Yale Divinity School, He wrote the date of his birth, 1932, on one end of the blackboard, followed by a short line to another date, 2010, which was followed by a question mark. This could represent my life, he told the audience, a finite period with a beginning and an end. Neither he nor his students could guess how much shorter that actual line would actually be. Then he shook his head. Returning to the blackboard, he drew a line from one end of the blackboard all the way across to the other, and he said, I've come from somewhere, and I am going someplace else. Unlike Merton, Nouwen was not a monk, though part of him wanted to be. Probably St. Benedict would have included him among what he called derisively the gyratory monks, who restlessly, quote, wander in different countries, staying in various monasteries for three or four days at a time. Nevertheless, like Merton, Nouwen appreciated the meaning of conversatio morum, which we discussed last time, what Merton called the most necessary of monastic vows, the ongoing struggle to go more deeply into the heart of one's vocation. Nouwen, like Merton, was a spiritual explorer who invited his readers to accompany him on a journey ever deeper into the heart of the divine mystery. Where that was ultimately calling him, he was not sure. Through his doubts, sufferings, and restless searching, he clung in faith to the confidence that our origins and our destination are hidden in the mystery of God. That being so, our task in this life, whether it's long or short, or whether heavy with sorrows or light with blessings or a combination of the two, was to find the path that conveyed us toward that goal. Whether Henry found the home he was seeking is something he alone knows. But in his prolific writings, as much as Merton, he left a trail for fellow seekers. Henry Nouwen came to the United States in 1964 to study psychology and spiritual direction and stayed on to teach at a number of distinguished schools, Notre Dame, Yale Divinity School, Harvard Divinity School. By the time of his passing, 32 years later in 1996, he had become one of the most popular and influential spiritual writers in the world. His popularity was only enhanced by his willingness to share his own struggles and brokenness. He didn't present himself as a spiritual master, but like the title of one of his early books, as a wounded healer. Those who knew him were aware of how deep his wounds ran. He was afflicted by an inordinate need for affection and affirmation. He was beset by anxieties about his identity and self-worth. There seemed to be a a void within that could not be filled. Nouwen had a great gift for friendship, and wherever he went, he sowed the seeds of community. But still, something drove him from one place to another, one project to another, from Holland to America, from Notre Dame to Yale, to a Trappist monastery where he spent a sabbatical as a guest monk, an experience he described in his breakthrough book, Genesee Diary. Undoubtedly, he was drawn there in part by his early attraction to Merton. They had actually met one time at Gethsemane, though it seems that Merton, possibly having trouble with Henry's accent, didn't really get his name. He refers in his journals to a pleasant talk with a 
Father Now, N-A-U, from Holland. Now and shared a bit of Merton's restless nature, as he indicated in the introduction to the Genesee Diary. My desire to live for seven months in a Trappist monastery, not as a guest but as a monk, did not develop overnight. It was the outcome of many years of restless searching. I kept stumbling over my own compulsions and illusions. What was driving me from one book to another, one place to another, one project to another? Unfortunately, as he acknowledged in the conclusion to his diary, written six months after leaving Genesee, it had been an illusion to think that he would emerge from this experience, quote, a different person, more integrated, more spiritual, more virtuous, more compassionate, more gentle, and more joyful. He traveled to the missions in Latin America, an experience he described in his diary, Gracias, and contemplated becoming an affiliate of Marinol. Some years ago, I gave a retreat at Marinol where the former superior general from that time described how Henry had sought his advice about this plan. He said he'd advised Henry that he didn't think it was the right path for him, and he said he'd always wondered whether that was the correct advice. I assured him, Father, that was 100% the right advice. Eventually, Henry ended up at Harvard Divinity School. This came after a big celebration at Genesee to celebrate his jubilee as a priest, which I attended. He was thinking that Genesee would be the base of operations for his ongoing life, and he publicly thanked the abbot for giving him a true home. The next week, Henry called me to say that he was thinking of coming to Harvard. But I, I thought that Genesee was going to be your true home, I said. Well, he said, the abbot thinks that maybe this is not such a good idea. So he came to Harvard, where he quickly felt out of place. His lectures attracted enormous crowds, but the celebrity only underlined his abiding sense of loneliness and isolation. Later he wrote with feeling about the temptations that Christ suffered in the desert to be relevant, powerful, and spectacular. One time I heard Parker Palmer talk about how he'd listened to Henry give that uh, speech, and in his accent, relevant, powerful, and spectacular, he thought he was talking about being an elephant, and he thought, well, an elephant is pretty powerful and spectacular, etc., Anyway, but behind all this restlessness, there was an underlying effort to hear God's voice, to find his true home, to know where he truly belonged. At this point, there came a great turning point in his life. Over the years, Nowen had visited a number of L'Arche communities in France and Canada. At a time when he was feeling himself at a dead end at Harvard, he was invited to spend a year living at the L'Arche community in France. I think the deal was sealed for Henry when the invitation said, maybe we can offer you a home here. That, he wrote, more than anything else, was what my heart desired. In The Road to Daybreak, Henry's journal of that year, he wrote movingly of his efforts to adjust to his new home. This is the first day of my new life, he begins his diary, and indeed it was a year of tremendous growth, though marked, as he made it clear, by the same old struggles with rejection, his extreme sensitivity, his propensity to fill his every moment with projects and busyness. A priest to whom he shared his restlessness told him the obvious. The issue is not where you are, but how you live wherever you are. That had not changed by the end of his time there. Quote, I am still the restless, nervous, intense, distracted, and impulse-driven person I was when I set out on this spiritual journey. He still had a long way to go. In 1986, during his year abroad, he received a formal invitation from Daybreak, the large community in Toronto to become their pastor. It was the first time in his life he had received such a formal call. With trepidation he accepted, and daybreak became his home for the last ten years of his life. It was unlike anything he had ever known. Nowen had written extensively about community, but he had never really known community life. That was to change at daybreak, but it was a struggle. A man of great intellectual gifts, he was physically clumsy, he was challenged by such everyday tasks as parking a car or doing the laundry or making a sandwich. In one of my first encounters with Henry Nowen, when I was a 20-year-old editor of The Catholic Worker, I made the clumsy error of rejecting the series of articles he'd written about community, judging them, in fact, too abstract. Ten years later, when I told him I'd been offered a job at Orbis, he, he remembered that early rebuff, and he told me he didn't think I had the human gifts for this line of work. Interesting postscript, uh, recently, decades after Henry's death, 
I thought back on those articles and had the idea of publishing a collection of Henry's writings on community. The stone that the builder rejected would become the cornerstone. At daybreak, Henry may have assumed he would be concerned chiefly with pastoral tasks, but like other members of L'Arche, he was assigned to care for one of the handicapped residents. In fact, one of the most severely handicapped adults in the community, a young man named Adam, who could not talk or even move by himself. Henry spent hours each morning simply bathing, dressing, and feeding Adam. Some of his old admirers wondered whether Henry Nowen was not wasting his talents in such menial duties. But to his surprise, he found this an occasion for deep inner conversion. Adam was not impressed by Nowen's books or his fame or his genius as a public speaker. But through this mute and helpless man, Henry began to know what it meant to be beloved of God. This wasn't, of course, the end of his struggles. After his first year at daybreak, Henry suffered a nervous breakdown, the culmination of long-suppressed tensions. For months he could barely leave his room. Now he was the helpless one, mutely crying out for some affirmation of his existence. As he later described it, everything came crashing down, my self-esteem, my energy to live and work my sense of being loved, my hope for healing, my trust in God, everything. It was an experience of total darkness, a bottomless abyss. During these months of anguish, he often wondered if God was real or just a product of his imagination. But later he wrote, I now know that while I felt completely abandoned, God didn't leave me alone. With the support of his friends and intensive counseling, he was able to break through and to emerge more whole, more at peace with himself. Above all, he emerged with a deeper trust in what he called the inner voice of love, a voice calling him, quote, beyond the boundaries of my short life to where Christ is all in all. In 1995, he began a sabbatical year from his work as chaplain to the daybreak community. What will I have learned when I finally reach the end, he asked himself in his deeply revealing journal. In typical fashion, it proved to be an extremely busy sabbatical filled with constant travel, meetings, and intense work. In the summer of 1996, Nowen was working hard, struggling to complete five books. To many friends, he seemed happier and more relaxed than they'd ever seen him, talking with great enthusiasm of his coming 65th birthday and plans for the future. Thus it came as a great shock when he suddenly died of a heart attack on September 21st, while passing through Amsterdam on his way to work on a documentary in St. Petersburg. There were numerous ironies at play in this death, the culmination of a sabbatical year. Among these was the fact that a man so much afflicted by a sense of homelessness throughout his life should die in his home country, surrounded in the end by his 90-year-old father and his siblings. The subject of his planned documentary was his favorite painting, Rembrandt's Return of the Prodigal Son but perhaps the surprise should not have been so great. Nowen's posthumously published sabbatical journey contains abundant evidence of the terrible fatigue that was tugging at his sleeve, even as his restless energy pushed him forward with plans and projects in the quest for deeper answers. It's hard to believe he was not headed for some culminating experience, whether breakthrough or collapse or both. Before setting out, his friend Nathan actually asked what they should do in the case of his death. A strangely prescient question for a man who was only 63. Now and said that he wanted to assure his friends of his gratitude for the life he had lived. He would repeat those words to Nathan the night before his death. In fact, Nowen's writings from the last years of his life make it clear how much he had contemplated and prepared for this particular homecoming. In one journal entry he wrote, How much longer will I live? Only one thing seems clear to me. Every day should be well lived. What a simple truth! Still, it's worth my attention. Did I offer peace today? Did I bring a smile to someone's face? Did I say words of healing? Did I let go of my anger and resentments? Did I forgive? Did I love? These are the real questions. I must trust that the little bit of love that I sow now will bear many fruits here in this world and in the life to come. These were not random thoughts but the reflection of a man who had devoted unusual attention to the prospect of his own death and 
had adjusted his entire existential attitudes accordingly. The central question was not how much time remains, but rather how to prepare for death so that, quote, our dying will be a new way for us to send our and God's spirit to those whom we have loved and who have loved us. A particular catalyst for Nowen's reflections came soon after his move to the Daybreak community when he was nearly killed in a traffic accident. As he walked along a busy highway on one wintry day, his mind as usual on other things, he was struck by the side-view mirror of a passing van. Although it seemed at first that he had suffered only a few broken ribs, it emerged that his internal injuries were life-threatening. But in the hours that followed, as his life hung in the balance, something else happened. As he later wrote, I hesitate to speak simply about Jesus because of my concern that the name of Jesus might not evoke the full divine presence that I experienced. It was not a warm light, a rainbow, or an open door that I saw, but a human yet divine presence that I felt inviting me to come closer and let go of all fears. As a result, what was on the one hand a terrifying ordeal was also one of the most comforting events of his life. Death lost its power, he wrote, and shrank away in the life and love that surrounded me in such an intimate way as if I were walking through a sea whose waves were rolled away. I was being held safe while moving toward the other shore. All jealousies, resentments, and angers were being gently moved away, and I was being shown that love and life are greater, deeper, and stronger than any of the forces I had been worrying about. Anyone familiar with Nowen's propensity to worry, which is to say any reader of his previous books, would comprehend the immensity of the statement. In receiving this gift of peace, Nowen felt commissioned to share his new awareness with others. Having touched eternity, he now wondered whether his extra years were not given so that he could, quote, live them from the other side, to look at the world from God's perspective, and to help others to do the same without their having to be hit by the mirror of a passing van. In previous books, Nowen had taught that our lives belong to others beside ourselves, but now he perceived that this insight applies to our deaths as well. If we die with guilt, shame, anger, or bitterness, all of that becomes part of our legacy to the world, binding and burdening the lives of our family and friends. It is possible, on the other hand, to regard our dying as a gift, an opportunity to pass along to others our own sense of peace in God. In many talks on this theme, Nowen drew on an image taken from his lifelong fascination with the circus. In his later years, Nowen had developed a particular friendship with the Flying Rodleys, a troupe of trapeze artists whom he first encountered in a circus in Holland. For a time, he'd even joined them on the road, filling notebooks with his detailed jottings on every aspect of their craft. He entertained the notion of writing a book about the Flying Rodleys, believing that in their artistry he might find the new vocabulary for the spiritual life. He had been particularly fascinated by a remark from one of the flyers, the seeming stars of the trapeze act, who told him that, in fact, the flyer does nothing and the catcher does everything, as he explained. When I fly to the catcher, I have simply to stretch out my arms and hands and wait for him to catch me and pull me safely over the apron behind the catch bar. A flyer must fly and a catcher must catch and the flyer must trust with outstretched arms that his catcher will be there for him. In this circus wisdom, Nowen found a message of great power and consolation. So often, we measure our identity and success by how well we remain in control. But in the end, the final meaning of our lives may be determined by our capacity to trust, to let go, to place ourselves in the hands of another. In this light, he recalled the words of Jesus on the cross, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Dying, he said, is trusting in the catcher. In the last months of his life, Nowen was shaken by a particular death in the daybreak community. It was Adam, the severely handicapped young man whom he had cared for during the first year after his arrival at daybreak. Adam, who had helped him learn so late in his own life what it means to be beloved of God. Finally, after a lifetime of illness and disability, 
Adam had succumbed to his ailments at the age of 34. For the Larsh community, which regards its handicapped members as its core, Adam's death was a devastating loss. Nowen rushed back to Toronto from his sabbatical to share the grieving of Adam's family and friends. Compared to, say, Henry Nowen, Adam had accomplished nothing, not even the routine tasks that most people take for granted. He couldn't speak or dress himself or brush his own teeth. In the eyes of the world, the question would not have been why such a man should die, but why God had in the first place permitted him to live. And yet Nowen saw in Adam's life and death a personal reenactment of the gospel story. As he wrote, Adam was very simply, quietly, and unquietly there. He was a person who by his very life announced the marvelous mystery of, of God. I am precious, beloved, whole, and born of God. Adam bore silent witness to this mystery, which has nothing to do with whether he could or could not speak, walk, or express himself. It has to do with his being. He was and is a beloved child of God. It's the same news that Jesus came to announce. Life is a gift. Each one of us is unique, known by name, and loved by the one who fashioned us. Jesus, too, had accomplished relatively little during his short public life. He, too, had died as a failure in the world's eyes. Still, Nowen wrote, Both Jesus and Adam are God's beloved sons, Jesus by nature, Adam by adoption, and they lived their sonship among us as the only thing they had to offer. That was their assigned mission. That is also my mission and yours. Believing it and living from it is true sanctity. Nowen set out to write a book about Adam. It would be his last book. and As it turned out, I would be his last editor. And as was the case with all of Nowen's best writings, it was also about himself. He seemed to sense in the passing of this young man that he was being called to prepare for his own flight into the waiting arms of the catcher. It was as if he wrote, Adam was saying, Don't be afraid, Henry. Let my death help you to befriend yours. When you are no longer afraid of your own death, then you can live fully, freely, and joyfully. It was a voice he had heard before. In a book published the same month as his death, he had written, Many friends and family members have died during the past eight years, and my own death is not so far away. But I have heard the inner voice of love, deeper and stronger than ever. I want to keep trusting in that voice and be led by it beyond the boundaries of my short life to where Christ is all in all. Like everyone, I was stunned to receive the news of Henry's death. He'd come to my house for dinner just a few weeks before to drop off the manuscript for Adam. I'd been so moved by the occasion that I prepared a plaque for him from based on one of his books, and wrote to thank him for his years of friendship. Everything afterward was a blur. His family held a mass for him in Holland and then graciously arranged for his body to be sent for burial among the daybreak community in Toronto. I flew up for the day, and I saw him there for the last time in his open casket, a plain pine box, decorated colorfully by the Larsh residents. His large hands were at rest, no longer fidgeting, I was numb, unable to express any thoughts or feelings. But when I returned to work the next day, there was an envelope waiting for me in the morning mail addressed in Henry's unmistakable hand. It was a letter he had written ten days before his death. Boy, oh boy, he said, that is quite a plaque. I wonder if there's a humble enough place to hang it without announcing myself too much. He acknowledged his own gratefulness for our friendship, and closed with the words, I look forward to working with you in the years ahead. It was the first sign that my relationship with Henry was not over. In concluding his book, Henry had written of Adam, Is this when the resurrection began, in the midst of my grief? That is what happened to the morning Mary of Magdala when she heard a familiar voice calling her by her name. That's what happened for the downcast disciples on the road to Emmaus when a stranger talked to them and their hearts burned within them. Morning turns to dancing. Grief turns to joy, despair turns to hope, and fear turns to love. Then hesitantly someone is saying, He is risen, he is risen indeed. 
It would be nice to suppose that by the end of his life, Henry had resolved all the complexities of his personality. As his posthumously published sabbatical journey makes clear, that was not really the case. I sometimes wonder how I am going to survive emotionally, he wrote. He acknowledged his inner wound, his, quote, immense need for affection and this immense fear of rejection. Probably, he recognized, this wound would never go away. It was there to stay. But he had come to a deep insight that perhaps this wound, quote, is a gateway to my salvation, a door to glory, a passage to freedom. I'm aware that this wound of mine is a gift in disguise. These many short but intense experiences of abandonment lead me to the place where I'm learning to let go of fear and surrender my spirit into the hands of one whose acceptance has no limits. From Adam he had learned what it means to be beloved of God, which has nothing to do with our talents or special gifts. Jesus had not chosen his disciples because of their exceptional genius or their human gifts. He simply said, Come, follow me. To his disciple Peter he had said, When you were young, you girded yourself and walked where you would, but when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, and another will gird you and lead you where you would not go. Ultimately, trusting the catcher, Henry had learned to stretch out his hands and let God carry him to the home he had never known in this body. Henry Nowen is not the kind of person who is likely to become a candidate for sainthood. Yet for all the broken pieces of his own complex humanity, his life tells a story marked by grace, conversion, steady growth in the spiritual life. If his work continues decades after his death to attract a growing audience, it's not because readers wish to be like him, to imitate his example or follow his way, but because he helps them to see their own lives in relation to the story of Jesus, another gospel in the making. In the end, he did not return from his final journey. But I think in his struggle to remain faithful and to trust in God's loving providence, he is the type of restless seeker who opens a path to holiness for all those who struggle amidst life's doubts, unresolved questions, and uncertainties. Thank you very much for joining me today. We'll return again uh, to bring some conclusions to this series of reflections on a living gospel. I've enjoyed sharing them with you. I hope they've been helpful to you. Uh, and in the next session, we'll pull this together and, and think about how these lessons apply to our own lives, the living gospel that is being written in our own joys, sufferings, sorrows, and searching. Thank you very much. <laughs>